Oh, thank you, girl. Keep on moving.
Reverend Jackson, it's a great honor to have you here uh, in, at the great Kennedy School. I'm Dan Glickman, director of the Institute of Politics here, and I want to welcome to Harvard one of our country's most prominent political leaders and social activists. From the coal mines of Appalachia to the barrios of Southern California, from the fields of South Carolina to the streets of Chicago, he's traveled the country to give voice to those not heard and give hope to those in despair. His, his speeches have brought many people to tears, but many more to their feet. Once on their feet, the people he organized and inspired marched. They broke barriers, changed laws, ran for office, and served their communities and their country. They and he made us a more perfect union. But I think our speaker tonight will make clear the job is not complete. While our Institute of Politics fellow Gary Flowers will formally introduce Reverend Jackson, I would like to recognize his remarkable political career in a few moments. In 1984, 20 years ago to, d to this time, his presidential campaign registered three and a half million voters and helped the Democratic Party recapture the U.S. Senate in 1986. In his 1988 presidential campaign, he registered over two million new voters and won seven million votes. In fact, in 46 of the 54 primary contests that he ran in, he finished first or second. Today we can look back on a man with a career few can match in this world. Through the ups and downs of a political activist, he fought for national health care, the rights of coal miners and farmers, prisoners and migrant workers. He worked for solutions between the Palestinians and the Israelis, negotiated the release of hostages in Kuwait and Iraq. He's negotiated the release of U.S. prisoners held in Syria and Kosovo, as well as the release of prisoners in Cuba. It's often been said that it isn't where you start in life, but where you finish. And in the race he's run, the lives he's touched, the people he's helped, by any measure, he's already won. But for him, there is still much more to do. We at the Institute of Politics try to communicate one central message to students at Harvard and around the country, and that is that your country needs you. Allow me to share with you his thoughts on his life and what yours can mean as well. This is from his electric and moving 1988 speech at the Democratic Convention in Atlanta, and I quote, I was born in the slum, but the slum was not born in me, and it wasn't born in you, and you can make it. Where you are tonight, you can make it. Hold your head high, stick your chest out, you can make it. It gets dark sometimes, but the morning comes. Don't you surrender. Suffering breeds character, character breeds faith, in the end, faith will not disappoint. On this occasion of the 20th anniversary of his 1984 presidential campaign, it is an honor to have him here at the Kennedy School. To introduce Reverend Jackson, may I present the Institute of Politics fellow, Gary Flowers, who serves as Vice President of Programs and National Field Director for Reverend Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition. Gary. Thank you, Secretary Glickman. We're here tonight to honor a visionary and his band of rainbow warriors who for the last 20 years have helped to shape this country's political history. Reverend Jesse Jackson, unlike others in this country, has done more to transform American politics than most, maybe with the exception of Ronald Reagan. After all, Ronald Reagan won the White House, but Reverend Jackson won the hearts in your house. <laughs> Reverend Jackson united people where Ronald Reagan shut down unions. Ronald Reagan touted trickle-down economics. Reverend Jackson proved that power percolates up. Reverend Jackson brought Lieutenant Goodman home from Syria, but Ronald Reagan left him there. Ronald Reagan campaigned in Neshoba County, Mississippi, where three civil rights workers were murdered. Reverend Jackson has advanced the cause of civil rights like no one else in this country. In sum, Reverend Jackson has registered more voters. Reverend Jackson has transformed the not only American politics, but the democratic process for all of the world to see. 
And so we're here tonight to honor not only Reverend Jackson, but the Rainbow Coalition and its 20th anniversary in transforming America. Please stand to your feet and welcome none other than the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. Thank you. Let me express my sincere, sincere thanks to you, Dan Glickman, for such a kind and generous introduction, and to you, Gary Flowers, a member of our organization who was here working this semester at, uh, at Harvard. I want to express thanks to a number of our key members who are here tonight, our National Minister's Director, director. Uh, you'll hear more from him in the future, Reverend Marshall Hatch. Please stand, Marshall. <clears throat> and our political director out of California, just an able and bright brother who has helped us all of these 20 years, Butch Wing. And one who will be speaking in the classes here fairly soon, who is an able and, in fact, very bright civil rights attorney from Atlanta, Georgia, Attorney Janice Mathis. <laughs> and the pride and joy of Georgetown, Texas, Shelly Davis. He's here someplace. And our political director, Bill Walls, hands for Bill. I've been asked to speak from this subject and, and look forward to when I would have finished for a session of Q&A and discussion. I'm on to speak tonight at Harvard on this government forum, the subject how to keep hope alive, the future of the rainbow, or coalition. The Rainbow emerged from my 1984 campaign. Like <clears throat> Joseph and Jesus and Dr. King, we knew that minorities could have majority vision. We raised hope <clears throat> as a weapon against cynicism. Those who major in you can't make it should not try because it has never happened before, abdicate the authority to lead, to raise hope as a, as a weapon. We removed the roof of impossibility thinking and said, go for it. And let's think in national international and not just in local terms. The Rainbow Coalition is now and was conceived of as a countercultural organization, a country that was built upon the supremacy of, of race and, and gender and religion has had a struggle to achieve its own dream of a multicultural society. White male supremacy, Christian religious supremacy. We've sought to build a rainbow, ab abolishing slavery, <clears throat> countercultural, a struggle. Ending legal segregation, countercultural. Seeking gender equality, countercultural. Women's right to vote, <clears throat> countercultural. Workers' right to organize, countercultural. 
Freedom to debate and participate in foreign policy. These are all countercultural acts. Inclusion is an excluding, exclusion in an excluding society is countercultural. Recall that the Rainbow Coalition emerged in the context of the Reagan counter revolution of the 1980s. Jimmy Carter won the presidency in 1976, rising from behind the cotton curtain in Georgia, and seeking to enact with Andy Young as UN ambassador an international human rights foreign policy. But this path was derailed with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Iranian crisis, but the US backed Saddam Hussein and Iraq and providing the regime with chemical and biological weapons in that war. These international superpower crises led to Carter's defeat in 1980, and the ushering in of the Reagan counter-revolution, an unbridled US nuclear weapons buildup, military and nuclear contention with the Soviet Union in many regions of the world, and the reactionary rollback of civil rights at home. Thus, the Rainbow Coalition connected the people's movements in the African Americans, Latinos, Asians, people of color, the peace and nuclear freeze movements, and the others engaged in fighting Reaganism of the 1980s. We see the world so often as Americans through a keyhole and not through a door. We see the map and refuse to look at the globe. We are a great and a blessed nation. One third of our hemisphere is North America. And we speak English as our main language. Two thirds of our hemisphere speaks Spanish. How can you reasonably fight for NAFTA one day and English only the next day? 250 million people live in Brazil, they speak Portuguese. Half of all human beings are Asian, half of them are Chinese. One eighth of all human beings are African, one fourth of them are Nigerian. There are a billion people in India, twice more than the US and the Soviet republics combined. We represent 6% of the human race, 6%. The Russians, 6%. So when Mr. Bush and Mr. Putin meet, it is a minority meeting. <laughs> they represent one eighth of the human race. In the real world order, looking through a door, not through a keyhole, most people in the world tonight are yellow, brown, black, non Christian poor, female, young, and don't speak English. We can lead that world by our values, but not threaten it and guide it and rule it by our guns. We must see the globe, not just a map, the world through a door and not through a keyhole. There have been profound shifts since World War II. There's been a major shift in US being over the world emerged as the power without peer coming out of World War II, over the world with a host of military and economic forces and power and economic growth. The Pearls and Wilfersets, Rumsfields and Rices, architects of the Reagan's imperialist foreign policy then were when there were two superpowers, have wrestled control of the Bush foreign policy and now seek hegemony in a one superpower world, engaging in unilateral preemptive military strikes against the so-called axis of evil as the foundation for foreign policy. We've gone from being over the world to now, by contrast, we recognize the shift in mutual dependence with the rest of the world in so many areas. Assets are more widely distributed, the U.S. is increasingly becoming dependent on the rest of the world, from being over 
equivalent now so often dependent. One sixth, one third of our hemisphere, six percent of the rural community. In such a world, we cannot afford to waste talent and based on race and color and gender and religion. We're no longer in the surplus. We now export jobs and import talent and outsource content. We must make some fundamental psychological cultural shifts. From a history of racial battleground to economic common ground to moral higher ground. We don't have people, not talent to waste. Whites resist blacks' demands for an even playing field in domestic policy, but they prefer often legacy points and inheritance over effort and merit. But historically locked out, we know that effort and ethics and excellence matter very much, but inheritance and access matters even more. For example, while sons and daughters of inheritance resist demands for an even playing field at home, they now struggle for an even playing field in foreign trade. Outsourcing has now evolved into offshoring. We're losing jobs to trade policy where capital has been globalized. We've not globalized human rights and workers' rights and women's rights and children's rights and environmental rights. The same is true for the sons and daughters of the locked out seeking to even the playing field at home. Blacks and Latinos do exceptionally well in the athletic arena, football and basketball and baseball and, and track. And we do so for three basic reasons. We do so well when the Patriots play Carolina. I saw a strange scene. I was in Houston and about 20 New England Patriot Fans came up to me, and about three Panther fans came up from North Carol and South Carolina. It's a river. Who are you pulling for? I said, I'm pulling for Carolina. And the Patriot fans booed. They say, Why? I said, I waited a long time for whites from South Carolina to pull for Black Panthers to score touchdowns on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> But we do well in athletics. <laughs> Y'all got that? <clears throat> when they wanted Black Panthers to beat up Patriots <laughs> on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> we do well because the playing field is even. It's no mystery. The rules are public and the goals are clear. If on that football field, if Whites, if blacks had to run 12 yards to prove something, and whites only had to run seven yards for a first down because they inherited some yards. <laughs> <clears throat> Be a big debate on the football field. <clears throat> Long as it's 10 yards for all first downs and six points for all touchdowns, and all the points count, <clears throat> we do very well. Even the field. Make rules public and make goals clear. Beyond the playing field, when the rules are not public and the goals are not clear, we're less likely to become coach, athletic director, a president of Harvard or Yale or UCLA. Not lack of brains or ability because of an uneven playing field and rules carried out behind closed doors. If the rules are not clear, it's hard to achieve these positions. In the New South, whites tend to vote racial fear rather than economic interest. Blacks often vote despair over hope. Last election in South Carolina, 288,000 blacks did not vote, 278,000 did vote. More did not than did. 
lost the governor's race by 40,000 votes. That softened whites. 30% of all workers in that state work below the poverty level, mostly working poor people. 175,000 children in poverty. They've lost 75,000 jobs in the last three years. Most uninsured seniors, most uninsured women. Yet many of them voted for right to work laws. They voted for the right to not be at the table as they see their, as they see their jobs go abroad. Many of them who are working in poverty wages are voting for the top 1% to get a tax break. Voting racial fears over economic interests. Tax break came and those who make over a million a year got 60,000. Those who make less than 50 got less than 600. So they got the tax cut, a job cut, and a benefit cut. They must now reassess where their interests lie. When the plants close and the jobs go and the lights are turned out, you can't use race for a color. You use race and color as a, a weapon or as a lever or as a crutch because we all look at major assembly in the dark. The challenge of choosing economic interests over racial fears. The challenge of blacks and browns to revive our hopes again. The key to the new coalition, the New South Coalition. Eight million blacks are not registered tonight. Plus those who are who do not vote. Plus those who are increasingly ineligible because of the jail industrial complex. Ironically, and contrary to stereotypes, blacks often vote their interests in increasing numbers. We often challenge, why do don't, why don't blacks just vote Democrat blindly? They are herded, they don't think. That is less true of blacks than working class and poor whites. Blacks tend to vote our interests. Come out of the slavery period, blacks who could vote voted for Lincoln, emancipation was in our interest. Given the depression, blacks shifted in great numbers to Roosevelt. That was our interest. Before that, we voted for Truman, who desegregated the military. That was in our interest. In 52 and 56, more blacks voted for Eisenhower than for Stevenson. He promised to bring the troops back home. I can hear my mother now saying, right man, wrong party talking split ticket before she even had the right to vote. In 1960, Dr. King's father was a black Lincoln Republican. He was going to vote for Nixon, but Dr. King was arrested and jailed for 30 days over a traffic ticket. And so Nixon would not reach out for him, and Kennedy did, and they shifted their vote. And Kennedy beat Nixon by 112,000 votes. We voted our interests. We were not herded. But the whites who vote for a tax cut for the wealthiest and a job cut for themselves apparently are being herded in. We cannot allow the wedge issue of the flag and the race bait to offset the impact of tax rebate and subsidies and no bid contracts. <coughs> Increasingly, Walmart, a Confederate Trojan horse, on the outside of the horse, the name, cheap prices. Inside the horse, it means cheap wages, no health benefits, and crushing small vendors and businesses. Our foreign policy must not be foreign to our values. There must be an appreciation of mutually beneficial policies. There are seven principles that are key to stability, growth, and peace in foreign policy. Self-determination economic justice, international law, human rights, one set of rules, mutual respect, and reciprocal trade. These values do not flatten the field, they even the field. 
The world seeks this relationship not just on the Olympic field every four years. The Bush foreign policy, however, is built upon principles that lead to isolation, our way or the highway, and supremacy. We will strike you preemptively and marginalize you. Coming out of the World War II, we, we sought to lead by hope and promise, but now we seek to lead by intimidation and bribery. The Iraq quagmire is based upon a vast deception, a preconceived view of the new Middle East, with Iraq's head cut off, a figment of the imagination of Pearl, Wolfowitz, and Cheney. Africa is again off the radar screen as the trading partner and the original source of our subsidy, slavery, and in dire need of help that it deserves, AIDS treatment, for example. Haiti is again in turmoil. Haiti is the poorest nation in this hemisphere. It was our ally in the American Revolution. Haiti's defeat of Napoleon and France stopped French expansion, led to the Louisiana Purchase, bringing us much of the land west of the Mississippi. Haiti is our ally. It does not stand the reason to bomb and kill and die to create democracy in Iraq and undermine democracy in Haiti. Today we see the bitter fruits of the shift from surplus to deficit, passing on unfunded mandates to the states, downsizing the middle class, expanding poverty, and creating a record north-south divide between surplus culture and deficit culture. The Bush administration's response to our appeal to be inclusive and reduce the pain has been a closed door policy. There's not been one meeting in three years with historic civil rights organizations, the Black Caucus, and all with labor. They seek to stack the course with Confederate judges and manipulate images of black and brown faces. Their views are contrary often to the masses and are unacceptable. So there are three blacks in Bush's cabinet. He sent a lawyer to the Hill to vote against affirmative action, the rights that made them possible. Against these odds, with the radical right of drift, we must build a coalition, indeed a multiracial, multicultural rainbow coalition, and we must revive hope. We must revive hope in the vote and urge massive voter registration. All colleges and universities must have polls on their campus. High school seniors must be registered to vote as they choose college over war, and lower tuition, and a world of peace. We must revive the hope of the possible and, and the not yet, and that which ought to be. For there is hope, flowers blossom. For cynicism abounds, people explain what can happen but did not happen and fulfill their prophecies by their inaction. We need the hope to close the credibility gap with the White House. As we look at boundless wars abroad and historic economic deficits at home. We need to combat our vision beyond politics and recognize that the battle is now on the economic front. A struggle can be defined as we seek to make this a more perfect union, maybe by four stages. Stage one, ending 246 years of slavery. Stage two, ending legal segregation. Stage three, achieving the right to vote. Stage four, access to capital, industry, and technology. We must demand access to the private sector, to capital, and to technology. There's $7 trillion in mutual foreign assets. Ten companies manage three trillion of those assets. All minorities combined, less than five billion or less than one percent. A trillion dollars in 401k funds, zero managed by people of color. Billions in endowments, Harvard, 20 billion, 12 billion at Yale, 9 billion from the United Methodist Church, 5 billion from the Episcopal Church, 100 billion plus from GM. 54 billion from Boeing, virtually none managed by people of color. It's our money. We are taxpayers and workers, investors. We have the right to help expand the base of capital investment. As workers, investors, consumers, and taxpayers, we have the capacity to demand that at least 5% of these assets be managed by people of color. This is how we green line, red line America. 
This is the way to build underserved markets, underutilized talent, and untapped capital. We did not know how good baseball could be until everybody could play. We must revive hope. We need more than a change of presence. We need a change of direction. Democrats and Republicans cannot be flip sides of the same coin. We need a, a new assumption. We need a new direction, a new third political force to challenge both parties to open up and include the locked out of America. We must honor the best in the American dream, the very best. Democratic values, freedom, equality, and opportunity. We must lead the world by the best of our values, freedom of speech, our commitment to the Bill of Rights. We cannot lead by deception, military might, and raw power. It's with this hope and vision that the Rainbow Coalition seeks to transform America to be the nation it ought to be and can be. We cannot conform to the image today of a ship without a rudder that has us in shark-infested seas far from shore. We look to, view, to the view expressed so profoundly on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tide, your poor, your huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, the tempest toss to me. I lift my lamps beside the golden door. It is in the end, my friends, a matter of character. Essential integrity in the process. Jesus put it this way. To the one day, a, a man was walking down the street, tending to his business. And two thieves left from behind the bushes and robbed him and left him to die. As he bled and dying, he had a glimmer of hope. He saw a man of his own religion, a rabbi, a minister, a man of God, coming his way. And, but the man of God, fully religiously robed, went to the other side of the street and kept walking. Jesus says, is that your neighbor? Another man came down the street of his own ethnic group, my own ethnic kin. He surely thought he would get help then, but he went to the other side of the street and he kept walking. Is that your neighbor? Another man, this American, came down the street from another country of another religion, of another race, who spoke another language, didn't even have a green card, and he, <laughs> he stopped and helped him up. He went beyond color, beyond culture, up to the high plateau of character, beyond color and culture. He rose above color. You are your color through no effort of your own. You did nothing to be your color. Accept it, but don't brag about it. It's, it's not your effort. And so, when beyond culture, you speak the language of your neighbors. Beyond color and culture, something called character. It's the high ground, you see. Even if you can't get there, keep reaching for it. In our modern time, one day, a man named Rodney King was going down the highway, and racist police stopped him and began to beat him. They were racist. And don't assume all whites are racist on that basis because while they were beating him and getting some perverse gratification, a white photographer named George Halliday heard the bumping, the thumping, and the cries. He looked out of his window. George Halliday could have said, this black in our neighborhood, they must have caught him doing something. Could have said, he shouldn't be here. He could have said, all those police couldn't be wrong. He could have said, it's not my business. He could have said, I'm not going to get in trouble. But some parent's advice, some mother or father's advice, some minister's admonition made that photographer film the beating. You know about Rodney King because of a white photographer, not just the cries of a black injured man. George Halliday went beyond color and culture of the character. That makes him the hero and Rodney King Miller the victim. And then when those four police were set free, and that was rebellion, angst over the unfair treatment of black and brown people. 55 people were killed. A white, a white driver made a miss turn and drove through Watts, Reginald. And when he got there, Reginald Denny, Mr. Denny, Four blacks snatched him out of his truck and began to beat him. Unless you think all blacks are thuggish and react. It was live on television. 
and four blacks who saw it who did not know each other left the individual homes. Russia saved him from them because it was the right thing to do. Rushed him to a hospital where some black affirmative action doctor performed surgery and saved his life. <laughs> beyond color, beyond culture's character. Thank you very much. Let me go over a couple uh, agreed upon rules in the tradition of the Kennedy School Forum. First of all, as we open for questions, questions tend to last 10 to 15 seconds and are usually followed by a question mark. So if you keep that as a guiding force, I think we'll be fine. Questions? Yes, sir. I was a supporter of yours when you ran for president, and I will always be. Thank you, sir. Uh, we read here that your campaigns broke new ground in US politics, and I think we all agree with that. Um, in this primary season, we've seen your son endorse Howard Dean in a campaign that portrays itself as being different than other campaigns that preceded it, and yet you chose not to endorse anybody. Would you comment on the Democratic primary season and what you see happening and why you chose not to endorse anyone? Well, since I was not running, I did not want to choose one and be attacked by eight. It's bad math. <laughs> uh, Howard Dean made a contribution that would be as big as the nominee. He set the pace, and often the pace setter does not win the race, but determines the winner. Democrats seem to have melted into the sameness, almost indistinguishable from Republicans with their political correctness. When Republicans stole the election in 2000 by the extreme, by the extreme by the, ordinary, by the Supreme Court doing an extraordinary thing, by stopping the count, they chose to arbitrarily stop the count. It's like if the Celtics were playing the Knicks and you were losing by five points with 10 minutes to go and somebody just cut the lights out and said, well, it's time to go home. <laughs> they just stopped the count. The senators had the right to hit the floor and to challenge that outcome and did not kind of concession. And they went along with these tax bills and he and Horn. Dean emerged saying the tax bill for 1% in the main, the offshore to avoid paying taxes, no bid contracts is just wrong. He took it with clear language. He said, I misadventure into Iraq where we preemptively struck and found no weapons of mass destruction and sought to isolate the UN and divide, um, divide Europe was high risk and just wrong. Our trade policy must be revisited because we're losing jobs and we can't compete because the field is not even. And it was that sense of dynamic that attracted these people to Dean. But in the, in the run of things, in the, in, in the last, in a two month period, the other eight used every arrow they had and just bludgeoned him almost into submission. But in the meantime, they began to capture his language and his spirit. And now all of them are challenging unfair tax policy and unfair trade policy, misadventure into Iraq. And that's a good thing, but that is a good contribution. Now there's emerging out of all of this, a commit by all of them to support the winner, and that's a good thing. Because you win and lose these big races by the margins of anger, despair, 
our breakaway votes. And so the commitment of all of them to support the winner is the key to victory. We can rise above the skirmishes of the intra-squad game for the interleague game, which comes in the fall. And so that is a good sign. It seems that the issues that are being raised now are so fundamental. One, can you trust what the president says? The credibility gap with the White House. Were there weapons of mass destruction? Did we need to preemptively strike? Was that an Al Qaeda connection? Was that uranium coming from Niger? Americans have died. Thousands injured. Iraq is killed by the thousands. That must be, account that must be accountability for this. So that's, it's even clearer now than it was last February that the misadventure is costing lives, money, and our national honor in the world community. Secondly, there is a focus now on revisiting trade policy because the present field is not even for workers. Globalizing capital is a good thing, but you've you got to also globalize human rights, workers' rights, and labor rights, and, and the like for it to make sense. And now tax policy. So Kerry emerges with outstanding credentials. And some combination of Kerry and his choice will be a formidable foe come September. And you contrast his uh, saving uh, soldiers in the heat of battle, being a military hero. You contrast a military hero with a National Guard dodger. You got some on, oh, on your hand. And so that's a piece of it. And so this will be uh, an, an, a campaign uh, uh, of great historic proportions. Yes, sir. Um, one of the most vibrant movements on university campuses of the past decade has been the anti-sweatshop movement. And back in 1996, you very courageously went to Indonesia and challenged the Nike Corporation about some of their policies on labor issues. There's a perception today, though, in the anti-sweatshop movement that push and rainbow coalition has gotten support from Nike and that today there's not really an aggressive stand against Nike the way it was earlier in the 1990s. Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe address that. I know I've been told Veda manager received an award and he's on the sports task force um, for, for the rainbow coalition. Um, he's there uh, directors of global issues management. So Nike seems to have a pretty prominent role now. And people sort of would like to get Rainbow back on board fighting on anti-sweatshop issues and confronting Nike, just as you spoke out against Walmart today. Push is very aggressive uh, on anti-sweatshop. Matter of fact, we led the demonstration at Yale just a couple of months ago on on, on the anti-sweatshop. And, and not only that, also justice for, for janitors. Uh, also, the, the negative impact and the fallout of NAFTA because only half of the agreement was ever implemented. So that is not true. And if you are interested in, in relating to us on our anti-sweatshop efforts, uh, we have been involved, for example, deeply in the grocery strike in um, in California, where 70,000 workers have been out of work for now for six months. We've been in the thick of that struggle. I just left, uh, consistent with that, we just left California, San Quentin, where Kevin Cooper's life was spared about three hours and 42 minutes on last Monday night, apparently wrongfully convicted, and, and the Ninth Circuit held up his, has held up his execution. And so whether fighting uh, against capital punishment and wrongful convictions, or fighting um, against sweatshops, uh, our struggles continue and it is consistent. Yes, sir. Uh, if you could tell me, what is your strategy to revive the Rainbow Coalition nationwide, and what specific goals would the party pursue, such as fielding political candidates? We put a lot of focus in the last few years on voter registration 
racial reconciliation, and get out the vote efforts and campaigns all around the country. Many of the young people who now hold positions in politics, whether it's uh, Senator Hill in Florida, uh, uh, Kedrick Meeks in Florida, uh, Kilpatrick in, in Detroit, and around the country, we've done an awful lot of that. Uh, a lot of focus we've spent the last few years also on the Wall Street Project. Because while Washington is the capital of politics, we have just not evolved into focus on the economy where the private economic resources are. There are $54 trillion in private sector assets in our country. Why must we not focus on Wall Street? Well, Wall Street is built on the African slave trade. It's built on the shipping industry and the commodities exchange, shipping Africans and exporting cotton. That's why the African burial ground is in the in the Federal Plaza that today. And while we just focus on who's gonna be the president, who's gonna control seven trillion dollars in mutual assets? Who's gonna control the trillion dollars of 401k assets? Why, why don't the major universities have no person of color managing any of their endowment assets? Whether it's a 20 billion here, or 18 billion at Yale, or eight billion at Preston, or eight billion at Stanford, or 10 billion at the United Methodist Church. We demand the right to also manage in green line, red line America with our assets. It's our money. And so we have to have a two-prong approach here, both on the one hand, political registration as well as expanding assets. Now, we are making a shift. Yesterday we had a 20-year reunion meeting here of sorts at, at Harvard. We're putting in about 32 states a a, uh, a campaign infrastructure to mobilize in those critical states, whether it's battleground states or the South, a major focus for 2004 on racial reconciliation, voter registration, coalition building, and get out the vote. And that's what we'll be doing really from now until November the 2nd. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions for you related to the election this year. Uh, my first question has to do with the fact of the sameness of all the Democratic nominees right now. And I was a supporter of Carol Mosey Brown, and I know a lot of people who would have been, but they had this whole argument of she's not electable. She's black, she's a female, all this kind of thing. And I was wondering if you could speak to the whole idea of um, your idea of hope and what's possible um, in electoral politics, I, because I feel like um, the two-party system right now isn't allowing for what is possible to come really come up to the to rise to um, the fore. And so I guess my question has to do with when is time for somebody like Carol Mosley Brown or a black person or a female to be electable? And then my second question is: Is winning the race the most important thing to begin with? Let me discourage you from being discouraged. Okay. <laughs> the change that we seek never comes top down from some candidate. It's always bottom up. No political party that led the abolition movement of slavery, it came bottom up. No political candidate led the movement for women to right to vote, no, 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 no party championed that, and women did that. No political party led the drive for workers' right to organize, it came bottom up. No party led the right uh, for, 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 for black and brown soldiers to, to be integrated and not be in, in these target red ball expresses. No, no political party led the Montgomery bus boycott in 55. No party led the march on Washington in 1963 or led the drive for public accommodations and, or the right to vote in 65. We the people have the power. And so we're called that and when we act we, we shape political behavior. Leaders at their best. Often political leaders, when they're, because they're reconciling them in forces, they, they follow opinion polls. We must mold opinion. And that comes bottom up. When the Democrats and John Kennedy met in LA in 1960, they didn't have public accommodations on the agenda. That came out of Greensboro, February 1st, 1960. 
the student, the student movement brought, about, brought it about. When Robert Kennedy could look and see us marching in Birmingham and, and could say, um, the segregation is morally wrong and, that is, and also legally challengeable, it's because we were doing the challenging. Dr. King said to Lyndon Johnson, we deserve the right to vote. He got his Nobel Peace Prize and came back to the White House and, and thanked, and Lyndon Johnson said, you're a great guy. He said, I know all that, but what about the right to vote? Dr. King, I like you very much. You know I like you, you're a great guy, but I don't have the power to grant you the right to vote. You know that, I just can't give it to you. And if you, and the, I can't and the Congress won't. But if you get it, kiss the South goodbye for 30 years. Those were his words. The right to vote came from Selma, not from Washington. The bottom-up struggle of the people determines the behavior of the politicians. We're not good. When they, when they determine our behavior, we're not doing well. We must determine their behavior. That's when we're really doing well. We. So, if there's enough action around sweatshops, they'll make the best anti-sweatshop speeches. If we get polls on every college campus, you start not only voting, but start running for local office. You see, in 65, we got the right to vote. That was like a difficult thing. But the next big issue was, could 18-year-olds vote? Well, I can't trust the youth. Well, they're dying in Vietnam, so we got that too. We got the right. The big issue was residency, that you actually have the 18,000 plus students here at this university. You actually have the right to vote, register and vote in Boston. Vote where you get your mail. Vote here. Now, students from Harvard can run for city council. Here. You can run for state rep. Here. You can run for Congress here. You can vote for, for governor here. You're not going to go back home and deal with those local offices. And so, right here, you can begin between Harvard and, and, and BU and the like. You can, MIT, you can fashion Boston politics. You have that. But now, if you're just adrift, I'm in school, and you just uh, give up your right and you go drifting down the road. This, I was in California doing this Schwarzenegger Davis runoff, and I went to Sacramento State, and my 3,000 students there, and they said, they, this register came and registered for us, and we're going to, on Tuesday, we're going to have big numbers, we're going to vote. I said, where's your polling place? We don't have one on campus. Oh, we vote 10 miles in the city. So I went to uh, uh, San Francisco State. Gymnasium over 400 people, 500 outdoors, Rally to fight Prop 54. Um, what is the polling place? Uh, somewhere in the city. Went to UCLA, 35,000 students. What's your polling place? Well, we used to have five, but we don't have one this time around. We must demand that be polling places on all college campuses across America. That's how young people get involved in that process. But. Don't just vote for the snow-capped mountaintop. The power is in the mountain. The power is in city council and sheriff and DA and state rep. Get involved at the level where you are. Better that we heist the top of the mountain than the top of the mountain try to lift us. We got more power to heist it than it does to lift us. So power remains with us. And so don't be discouraged. Our vote does matter, and this time it will count. My name is Sylvia Clute, and I'm a mid-career student, and I want to say, Reverend Jackson, that I have enormous respect for you, but I have a question tonight that concerns me a great deal about something you have not mentioned. And as you say, the leadership has to come from the bottom up, and we have to have the speeches on it. But I haven't heard you mention this, and I didn't hear the two African-American presidential candidates mention this, which I believe is one of our greatest failed public policies, and it's doing enormous harm in the African-American communities, as well as others. And that's our criminal justice policy. For 20 years now, we've had 30-second sound bites that play on the fears of the people that have used our criminal justice courts to address all kinds of social issues, and in order to defend yourself in our criminal justice system, you have to have money to buy due process. The people that don't are the ones that go to prison. In Virginia, where I'm from, 70% of, of our prisoners are African Americans, 
but I hear no African American leadership addressing this. Why? Well, well I said in passing, trying to open up more time for Q&A than a lot of what I wanted to say. In every state, there are more blacks in jail than in college. In part driven by the five grams of crack cocaine mandatory sentencing. 500 grams of powder, you get probation, 100 to 1 ratio. 85% of all rural arrests are white. 76% of all urban arrests are white. 55% of all those in jail are black. Exactly. Oh yeah, of those in jail, 90% of high school dropouts. 85% nonviolent drug crimes. And 75% recidivist rate. It's a huge problem. Now, if you are Governor Bush's daughter and you get caught on crack three times, you get what you should get, frankly. You get monitoring and probation and care. She should not be in jail tonight because she is drug sick. But other children shouldn't be either because we should have one set of rules. Uh, if Rush Limbaugh is neither charged nor jailed, it's an opportunity, his crisis is an opportunity to challenge the laws. Because I think Rush Limbaugh, for his uh, illegal use of drugs, perhaps laundering money, because he's sick, should not go to jail. If that is true, others in the same situation should not go to jail either. And so just maybe his crisis can illuminate the darkness. We need one set of rules. Uh, I just left. Kevin Cooper, I told you I left San Quentin to come here. Go on death row 19 years. Scheduled to die at 1201 Monday night. Seems in San Bernardino, four whites were killed, the Ryan family. The survivor said he saw three white men running through the house. Somebody convinced him three white men looked like one black man. So it became <laughs> Kevin Cooper. Within a matter of minutes, it said that uh, three, the four whites were killed by three different weapons. Not a gun, but a hatchet, a knife, and an uh, ice pick or something like that. And so he ended up being in jail to die without, in, without adequate legal representation. So he goes through the process, and we found out, as we finally got a first-class law firm, a pro bono law firm, that, that one woman died clutching eight inches of uh, eight-inch blonde hair. Well, it was not his hair. It was not the woman's hair was clutching it. But they never brought this before the court, which is prosecutorial misconduct and withheld information. And then there was the blood. His blood was on the wall. But we found the vial was open. And perhaps reserve is put in it. Became another issue. A, a woman, uh, a UPI reporter named Christina, said that she was convinced he did the killing based on the evidence shown. She was in San Bernardino not long ago, uh, and um, while there, she's making small talk to a guy fixing a stereo, and said to him, "You what about the Kevin Clipper case?" She said, "He said, ma'am, he was set up." She said, oh, "I know better because I was I was a reporter." He said, "Ma'am, I was the first guy on the scene." He gave enough detail to convince her it was not just you know small talk, so we kept pressing, and then a woman named Christine. Another woman named Christine, who was a horse farmer up in Northern California, said that the night of the killing that she was with her friend, Mary Mellon, and two white men came in who had blonde hair through the kitchen, and they were sweating, drugged, and blooded. And so when the police finally did come, she assumed it was all over. When she saw Kevin Cooper's picture in the paper, she said something was wrong, but she was not going to get involved. As we turned up the heat last week, uh, the, the, the Ninth Circuit, uh, six jurors said if we had known then what we know now, we would not have convicted that man to die. My point is that without good lawyers, a legal, good legal team, you can't do the proper testing. You can't get the in investigators. You can't pursue leads. And so he'll be sitting on Monday night in, 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 the, in the death chamber, but them asking him, do you want to use your left arm or right arm for the needle? What do you want for your last meal? Uniform, you dime, let it be blue or white. And who do you want to be your psychiatrist? Put him in a four by four cell as he watched his granny roll in, he was to die on, 
and the IV connected for him to be poisoned to death. And as God would have it, at 819, the Supreme Court refused to overturn the stay of the Ninth Circuit. His life was spared. By the margin of seven days of intense work on a first-class law firm. And that's why Governor Ryan contended that we should have a more term on the death penalty because flawed system produced flawed results. So we are very into that, as you can tell, but I just didn't get into that tonight, but uh, you're right, and I'd like to work with you on that. Because we went to Goose Creek, South Carolina uh, a month ago, and uh, a police chief and his principal met, so they thought they saw some drugs being sold in the school. And, and the police and the, and the principal, they conspired. Kids came in school, they quartered them off, uh, uh, handcuffed them, pulled out 45 guns without uh, Glocks, no safety locks, uh, uh, had dogs dipping between the little girl's legs, and they found no drugs. And so the pattern of locking up and killing, that's why uh, the lack of access to Department of Justice is so criminal and so painful, because we are hurting the lights out in the Department of Justice. But thank you for raising that. Okay, ma'am? Yeah, this is kind of a tag on to the Carol Mosley Braun question. Um, realistically, do you think change, or, um, change can come before the time is ready? For example, like it takes 51 votes in the Senate for something to pass, not just one vote. Um, so do you think change can come before the time is ready? I do, and I'm sorry I didn't la ask the last part of a question. The fact is when you run, here's my experience, you need a message, money, infrastructure, and you need many volunteers. So on the stage, she had a sound message, a very simple message, but you cannot get them here to California just with a message. You need a plane and pilots and resources. And that's why at some point, her message was sound, but she did not have the money and the infrastructure. And so the, the fact is that uh, her presence on that stage, and Al's for that matter, uh, we've now, we're now getting used to seeing people of color debate the great issues of our time. So that's not getting beyond that the level of the culture shock. But to run a national campaign, you need message, money, infrastructure, and an army of volunteers. Yes, ma'am? Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Michael Munson. I'm a student at the Business School. And um, my question is that uh, many reports talk about one of the fundamental problems or I guess challenges facing the African American community is basically how the next generation is being and their mother and how this environment just does not allow for um, the kind of nurturing, transmission of values and education which is important. How important is that um, for the community and what, if anything, is being done or can be done? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a social crisis to have so many children raised without two parents. I see some guys in Washington today who had two parents, <laughs> grandparents, Harvard degrees, and out of their mind. <laughs> and so, uh, we, we, don't, we don't take light of that issue. But the fact is, what, what feeds it is, is the ghetto is, in effect, facing economic disinvestment. And poverty breeds its own kind and it, and it recycles. And so that is, um, that is a sense in which we must focus even more on education, health care, just all the stuff that makes for the conditions that lead to more stable families. Uh, today, if you were to ask people in my community what they need the most, they would say the means by which families can be raised that they need jobs that pay, and they need health care and schools that work. And people who have that tend also to have more and more stable families. There is a, there is a, a connection between stable families, st stable lives, and our economic conditions. No doubt about that. But I don't want you to forget this piece, too, by the way, since we own that, which makes our family somewhat peculiar and different. 1619 to 1865, for 246 years, the black family was illegal. Illegal. And from 1877 to 1965, it did not have the right to protect itself by law. 
The legacy of that disenfranchisement manifests itself in sometimes socially painful ways even to this day. Uh, poverty is not a theory. When I walk in the house with a mother and six children and they've not released the, uh, the heat money, um, Lahib, low income energy heat says she got six children in the room and um, having to choose between and, and, and having to cook on a hot stove and, and stay warm at propane gas and the kids go to school not to eat, not to study, but to eat and to get warm. Those conditions are real. And those children often prematurely have babies to have some warm and something powerful. This part of the thing recycles itself. People tend to break out of that cycle once they get an opportunity. And, and that's why we must keep fighting for equal opportunity. Reverend Jackson, I just wanted to get your opinion on some of the African American leaders in American government today. Um, basically, do you admire Colin Powell? Do you respect him as a person? Do you admire Condoleezza Rice as our national security advisor? I just want to get your opinions on some of the African American leaders today. Uh, keep on going. Uh, 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 um, Clarence yeah. Thomas. Uh, uh, Clarence uh, Thomas, keep on going. <laughs> First of all, I have uh, great respect for Colin Powell as a, as a leader. Uh, much of his capital is being spent covering Bush and Cheney's politics. Um, he's for affirmative action, Bush is not. He questioned going into Iraq unilaterally and preemptively. And while Rumsfeld was talking about old and new Europe and marching the UN, his judgment questioned that war, but yet he was at the UN trying to justify the weapons of mass destruction. So here's the case of a very able man uh, in a predicament uh, that uh, does not serve, I think, who he really is. Condoleezza seems to be comfortable in arguing the case for right-wing politics. Uh, but, but I'm not comfortable just dealing with Condoleezza and Colin because this is Wolfowitz and Pearl and Chena's war. And so I don't feel well about their vision of the Middle East. They were cooking up this Iraq scheme when Clinton was in office. They, they, they've been on this kick for a long time. And so now those who work for the administration have to, if they're going to stay there, have to figure out some way to make peace with it. Uh, so I think that they're in um, a predicament. It seems that Powell, for example, in the affirmative action issue, uh, on the Carter, Cliff Alexander uh, had a pool. Out of that pool came Powell as a general. He knows affirmative action has been beneficial to his development as it has been to women and others. So when Bush was sending the uh, Olson to the Supreme Court to kill affirmative action, he took a different position. Condoleezza identified with Bush, and it got so hot so quick she had to change it because clearly affirmative action has been good for America, and it's a majority issue. It's women and people of color. So they're in a dilemma, uh, the, the extent to which he tries to, and he gets on TV and says that Bush was right to preemptively strike Iraq. That we are better off now having killed all those people and gotten those American soldiers killed. It's all right to have spent $200 billion on that misadventure. I just simply disagree with that. I'm a journalist from Kenya, and um, I'm a student here. And as a student here, I believe I represent Africa. And when any, any choices are made in the, in the government here, they really affect Africa in so many ways. So we look at who has he chosen for, you know, to represent him in Africa, is he black? You know, those are very important issues for us. And when Powell and, and Dr. Rice were chosen, we, you know, we thought things are going to be good. And I think they've really had a hard time doing so much in Africa. And my issue is I've had a, a, um, a chance to talk to Dr. Rice about HIV AIDS in Africa. And uh, we agreed to disagree because I realized there are, there are priorities in this country. And HIV AIDS is a holocaust in Africa. 
what the blacks keep calling here motherland. You're soon not going to have a motherland if nothing is done in Africa about HIV AIDS. For me, it's a major issue now. It's a holocaust. If we don't do anything about it now, soon it's going to be really bad. My question is, in Africa, we look at you as not only a leader, a black leader in America, but also a black leader in America for us in Africa. What are you doing in as far as HIV AIDS is concerned for Africa? Because the issues you raised earlier, racism and whatever, they, I think they play a role uh, in, what's, in what's going on in Africa today. Africa is a minority. It, it doesn't matter so much, but it matters. What's your, what, what are you doing for us in as, in as far as that is concerned? You know, last Saturday we had uh, Africa, African American AIDS Day last Saturday. Focus on, on, focus on getting more testing and more resources is the number one killer of black America today is not drive-by shootings, it is HIV AIDS today. It's a big, it remains an issue here. Uh, Mr. Bush took this safari trip to Africa last year and kind of hopped and skipped to a few countries and promised $15 billion. The money has not been forthcoming. If, if he has, the public has got it all. They got the White House, House, Senate, and Supreme Court. But somehow the money has not yet been sent to Africa on the HIV AIDS issue. And we've kept the issue alive. Matter of fact, I'm going to a conference in Africa next week, meeting with the African heads of state on this issue. And we must do all that we can to keep it visible. The resources are in Washington, but, but, the, but, the, but the will to keep the line must come from us, and we're doing everything we can to do it. And I thank you for raising it. Hi. Uh, this question is coming partly or inspired by your bottom-up change must come from the bottom-up response. Um, I'm wondering, a lot of us as graduates want or are seeking ways to use um, our degrees from this university to push for a revolutionary change in terms of race in this country. And I'm wondering if your experience, um, you found that it's best to work within government, um, either as an elected representative or working um, an administrative official or outside of government uh, in the nonprofit world or, or other, um, even the corporate world, um, sort of what sector do you see as the best for us as individuals to push for change? It really is both and. You really need sensitive people in high places. You need sensitive people in the Department of Justice, our labor, our commerce, or in the White House. You need sensitive people who can argue around that table for policies that make sense in high places. You also need the outside force that creates the climate that makes it happen. Uh, John Kennedy could not just say, we need a public accommodation bill in, in Birmingham because it's wrong. With the students marching and Dr. King in jail and the dogs biting, he could, he could choose between King or Wallace. He chose King because it, it had a good guy in the White House and activity in the field. It takes it's, it's a both end combination. By the way, if you are interested in keeping up with what we're doing at Rainbow, our website is um, www.rainbowpush.org. And I want you to hear this because we're building a very, as we move toward our 30 state campaign for the fall, we need volunteers. If you're interested, you may get hooked up with us, but we're going we're gonna to have Freedom Summer this summer. Uh, there'll be a lot of activity beyond the convention in Boston. If you want to be a part of the of our, of our summer and fall campaign. Uh, matter of fact, raise your hands now. <laughs> well, if you do, really, uh, Gary is here as a fellow this, uh, this session. And so indicate that because we are looking for, we intend to have a freedom summer this summer, as we did in Mississippi in the 60s, and a real fall campaign for workers. And we, we need volunteers to make that commitment, okay? Yes? Your talk tonight has been a message of hope. You've stressed the word character. You talked about the, uh, the Rodney King photographer, <clears throat> the other, the, uh, the black people who helped the person in the car, and you've lived your life that way. You've striven, you've reached for the stars, you've had character. I think, though, that you gave Colin Powell a little bit of a free pass because if he had character and he's in this predicament, what's the noble thing to do if he's so averse to the policy? to say goodbye and make a statement, no? Well, I'm not sure it is, it serves a social use of purpose. 
for me to make a Jackson Powell headline. <laughs> I mean, you at Harvard, you can think. <laughs> Figure out for yourself what you want to say. I, mean, I, have, I have high regard for him. I disagree with the team he is on and his justification of this war. I, dis I disagree with that. But I can disagree and still respect him as a leader and as a person. I don't, I don't feel the need to uh, attack or demean him. I can just disagree, and that's enough. Uh, I appeal to him. I appeal to him to get more active involved in, in protecting the democracy in Haiti. He's, he's, he stood very strong fighting for democracy in Iraq. But the words about Haiti have been too sparse. He's from the Caribbean. You do know that Haiti had democracy before America did. You do know that when the French wanted to expand, the Louvertree defeated Napoleon in Haiti. And that stopped French expansionism. And that defeat is what enabled us to the Louisiana Purchase. Haiti is so critical to our existence as an expanded, growing nation, and yet that is the poorest nation in our hemisphere. And so it is unreasonable, it seems to me, to blow up a country to establish democracy in Iraq, and then, in fact, through our words, assist those who overthrow democracy in our own hemisphere. We urge the president and the secretary of state to stand with the elected government of Haiti. My question is, has to do with conversations with younger people. I work with younger people every day in a, one of the neighborhoods, um, impoverished neighborhoods in Boston. And I'm wondering, uh, when you have a chance to talk with someone who all they know is selling drugs to make money or they disrespect themselves, if you have a chance to speak with them, maybe on a bus ride home or a neighbor, are there certain questions that you suggest we engage them with or comments we make to them in passing? You know, I visit, we have a program called Push for Excellence, about six high schools a month. For the suburban in the inner city, I, I tend to ask them, how many of you know somebody in your school, you know somebody in your age group who is dead because of drugs? About half of them stand. You know somebody in your age group who is in jail because of drugs? Almost all of them stand. You know somebody in your age group who has considered suicide? About half stand. That's the plight of our children. While in jail alone, but I also try to convince them that strong minds break strong chains. You cannot let the slum break you. You cannot let oppression uh, be internalized and start acting it out, that you must be strong. And they are, they're strong enough to be the best basketball players on earth, football, basketball, baseball, they can do that, but they must have, and they must be convinced that their minds become their weapon and hope becomes their weapon. I said those youth in jail on Christmas Day, about 95% black, 12,000 inmates, 9,000 beds. Uh, how many of you um, in the Finnish high school, 10% stood with them on Christmas Day? And how many of you are in a nonviolent drug charge? And about four or five nonviolent drug charge. Uh, how many of you in here have a child at home and they all stood? Two children, they got back up. Three children, they got back up. I stopped. I said, look, I have a plan to close this jail down. Will you help me? They scream, we'll help you. What can we do? Don't come back no more. <laughs> I mean, at the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we must convince them to not come back. The, the football coach convinces them, you may come from a single home, you may come from a poor neighbor, but you can be the best on earth. On that basketball court, you, are not, you don't play based upon your, what's in your household. The coach goes deeper than your predicament. And so when I'm talking to those youth, I talk with a caring, tough love. I got every pathology a black male is supposed to have. Born a teenage mother, out of wedlock, South Carolina, parents couldn't vote. Everything you can think of, I got some of that. Having said all of that, I learned early on that to, um, Success needs no explanation and fear does not require one. It does, it's not acceptable. And that I had to, Janice's father, my coach, learn that you have to have turn 
adverse into advantage. We must, con we, we must not concede to these youth that somehow your, your, your history will dictate your future. We must convince them to be tough and they can make it. Why do I know they're tough? I saw the NBA basketball game this past Sunday. The best on earth come from the broken side of town because somebody convinced them they could make it. Re Reverend Jackson, um, you've come out critical about the things like the 2000 election, the California gubernatorial recall, uh, you've hinted at a third party uh, and whatnot. Could you say something more about election reform, your opinion, what you think are the problems with the election, where we should go, things like that? One, one of my concerns is, and I'll thank you for that, the night there are between 8 and 10 million unregistered black voters, almost a million in New York, 450,000 in New Jersey, about 500,000 in Virginia, 600,000 in, um, in Georgia, 650,000 in, in Florida. We just cannot give up that much territory and expect to win no matter what the system is. That's why we intend to put on three million new voters. We, we, we cannot expect to not go to the bat and get a hit. That's a piece of it. Second, I believe in on-site same-day registration. The reason Jesse Ventura won in Minnesota, people could make up their independent mind on the day of the election and run past the machinery. I believe in on-site same-day registration. If you leave at night and get a traffic ticket, if you ever got a ticket in Seattle, Washington, Miami, Florida, within the last 10 years, they will know in two minutes what your printout is. With that kind of technology, why do we need 30 days to close out voter registration? <laughs> we need to have on-site same-day registration. <laughs> and voting should be a holiday. It shouldn't be between and after work. It should be a holiday. Last one, yes, sir. Yahweh Skanu, Reverend. Aguagu uska jetwa vinuni aguatnagula. Tie duna helado nio tu hage aguatnagul ji skana nio tu hage aguatnagul danito. I greet you in my, my native language because I think our minds are the same, are the like, rooted in peace, power, and righteousness of a good mind. Those are the tenets of, of my people. I'm from the Oneida Indian Nation. And uh, Reverend, I, I would. Uh, I'd uh, just like to comment uh, uh, that uh, the, the land I live in embraces the dust of my ancestors since time immemorial. However, every day of my life back home, I need to, to fight to be recognized in the fabric of American life, in, in the privileged uh, uh, life. Uh, I, even though the United States Constitution uh, protects the rights of my people, Section 1, Article 8, uh, 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 mentions uh, the, the, and recognizes the plight of American Indians in this country. Even though veterans, my own Ida uh, ancestors, have given their lives and, and vowed to share in the fruits of victory to be buried in the same common grave, that's how strong our alliance and we have served in every conflict this country has had. Every day I need to, to, to fight to be recognized as part of the fabric of American life. I grew up in third world conditions. We don't need to look at third world countries to witness third world conditions. I grew up with no running water, unsafe housing, eight of us in the bedroom. Uh, it, it, was, it was horrific. And while I was born on a reservation, to, to use your words, I am not willing to be trapped by reservation life. Today, uh, back home, we have a, a group that has formed called Upstate Citizens for Equality. And while they wrap themselves in the, bla in, in the blanket of the American flag and, 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 and preach freedom, they practice racism and separatism. I'm wondering if Rainbow Push uh, has made any inroads to Indian country. Uh, and if not, I offer you the voice of 24 federally recognized tribes east of the Mississippi. Well, we have, in part because I'm part Indian, my father is. Um, but the other part of it is that the reason why we formed the Rainbow Coalition, we all got our misery index. If we close ranks, we can win. And this time around, if you're interested in being a part of the coalition with the tribes, connect with Gary and let's make it happen. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Reverend. Friends, please excuse me and thank you very much. God bless you.